Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is another case in my October Halloween serial killer series. I was honestly hoping to get more cases out to you guys, but man, these deep dives have been sucking me in for weeks. I spent so much time with Kristen Gilbert that I feel like I know her. Thankfully, I don't, but this is how much time I spent getting deep into researching this case. When I first started researching, I wanted to do all of this in one go, but there was just too much information to go over, so I decided to split it into two parts. I do apologize if the times on each video is a little bit off, like if one is a lot longer than the other. I tried my best to split it up in a way that made sense given how much we have to go over. It might not be exactly perfect, but that is okay. We don't have to be perfect here. I do plan to release these videos within a day or two of each other at most, so hopefully there's just enough time in between for you to rest and digest this information before moving on to the next part and learning more about Kristen Gilbert. Today, we will be discussing Kristen Gilbert, who she is, how she grew up, and what her life was like. Then we will discuss how her crime started and talk about the first few victims of hers. In part two, we will discuss the remainder of the victims as well as the investigation and trial and all of the crazy stuff that happened in between. Just like with my deep dive with Joanna Dennehy, this will be a long one. So sit back, get comfy, grab a notebook and a pen to write down some notes if you need to keep track of things because this one is a doozy with a lot of information. So let's just get into things. Kristen Gilbert was born as Kristen Strickland on November 13th, 1967 in River Fall, Massachusetts to Richard and Claudia Strickland. She was the oldest of Richard and Claudia's two daughters with Kristen's younger sister, Tara, being born seven years later in 1974. Her father worked in the U.S. Coast Guard for some time before going on to work as an electronics engineer. Meanwhile, Claudia was a homemaker and part-time substitute teacher. By all accounts, Kristen had a good, normal, middle-class upbringing being raised by parents who loved her. After Kristen's little sister was born, Kristen found herself spending more time with her grandparents. Kristen's grandparents would take her to the beach every weekend during the summers. They would bake fudge together and sew quilts. But as a child, her family noticed that she liked to tell white lies. Now, River Falls is the birthplace of the notorious Lizzie Borden, who was accused of murdering her father and stepmother with an axe back in August of 1892. She would later be acquitted of these murders, and no one else has ever been convicted. This case went on to receive massive publicity. It remains a hot button topic in American culture to this day with people still talking about her case. Back in the 1970s, little Kristen was one of those people. Kristen would actually go around telling people that she was related to the famous Lizzie Borden, although it was more likely that she wasn't. Obviously, they probably didn't do any DNA tests or anything like that, but there was no reason for her to think that she was related to her, so she probably wasn't, but she was really fascinated by Lizzie's story and was proud to be born in the same town that Lizzie was from. By the early 1980s, though, Kristen's family packed up and moved away from River Falls and to the small, quaint town of Groden, Massachusetts. Over the summers, they spent time in New Hampshire and Vermont and even would go on trips to Disney World. However, as time passed and Kristen and her little sister, Tara, grew older, they said that Claudia and Richard started to become less like loving, caring parents and sort of became robotic. They seemed like they just went through the motions of raising their two daughters and they became a lot more strict and regimented. So once Kristen got into her teen years, most notably by the age of 15, she started to rebel as many teens her age do. She spent a lot of time away from home, maybe associating with people that weren't the best influences on her, but even though she showed signs of rebellion and would tell a white lie here and there, she still did very well in school. When Kristen and her family moved to Groden, Kristen had no problem making new friends. 
She was attractive, thin, and popular. She was known to be full of life and full of energy. She did very well academically. She excelled through her classes in her sophomore and junior years of high school. School was actually very easy to her. She was within the top 10% of students in her class academically. But even beyond that, she was musically talented as well. She played the cornet, becoming a member of the marching band, orchestra, and jazz ensemble. Pretty much everything that Kristen tried, she breezed right through. Pretty much everything came very naturally to her. Kristen ended up graduating with honors from high school midway through her junior year, a year and a half early. By 1984, by the age of 16, she was accepted into Bridgewater State College, where she originally studied as a pre-med student, but eventually switched to nursing. But even though Kristen was intelligent and did very well academically, she was known to be a liar and manipulator to those around her. Like I said, she was always telling white lies since she was little, but as she got older, the lies got a lot more serious. The mother of one of Kristen's high school friends said that Kristen would lie and make up stories about everything. They would be talking about pretty much anything and then Kristen would just make up lies on the spot. The same applied to her romantic relationships. Kristen would always be dating a few guys at a time, but she always had to be in control of the relationships that she was in. For example, if she felt that she was losing control or if the guy that she was with showed signs of wanting to break up, she would start with begging for forgiveness, always promising to fix whatever she needed to to fix the relationship but that would turn to malicious tactics. There was one relationship in high school where Kristen's then boyfriend broke up with her and after he did so, she left him a suicide note. She said that she was going to be eating glass and kill herself because of the breakup. Obviously, being in high school, he got very concerned, so after getting the note, the boy rushed over to her house, but once he got there, she was totally fine. After that, the same boy started receiving creepy phone calls, the phone would ring, he would pick up, and the person on the other line would just breathe heavily into the phone. That's very creepy, and if you want to creep someone out, that's what you would do. This boy knew that it was Kristen, but any time he confronted her about it, she would become enraged. There was one time that she even attacked this boy, scratching his face with her fingernails and causing him to bleed. Then there was another boy who broke up with her who claims that she tore the spark plug wires out of his car, keyed the sides, and popped three of his tires. There was one more boy in high school who I guess she had planned a date with, but he stood her up. She pretended not to care, but she had a plan in mind to get him back. One day, she was in class with him, and they had finals that day. So, after the boy took his test, he walked to the front and placed it on the teacher's desk. After that, Kristen got up and put her test on the desk, slyly grabbing the boy's test and taking it with her, obviously to ensure that his test wasn't there and that he would fail. In fact, he would get a zero. She went home and burned that test to make sure nobody ever found it. That was an act that she was very proud of at the time. So as we can see, Kristen did not handle rejection well. She had a long string of tumultuous relationships and always had to get her revenge after these relationships ended. But by the summer of 1986, after her first year of college, 17-year-old Kristen met the man of her dreams, Glenn Gilbert, who was two years older than her at the time. The two met at Hampton Beach, where Kristen had frequented during her college years and where Glenn had been vacationing that week. After meeting, the two quickly started dating. Now, they did have a bit of distance between them at first, but by June of 1987, Kristen ultimately transferred to Greenfield Community College. There, she would be closer to Glenn, who lived in Northampton, while she continued studying nursing. Now, she was only a 20 minutes drive away from him, and they no longer had this long-distance relationship. While studying to become a nurse, then 20-year-old Kristen got a job working as a home health aide, and this is when some of the more concerning aspects of her personality, I guess, started to come out. One of her first patients was a young boy who was deaf, mute, and had severe physical disabilities. He was living with his foster family who had another young child with disabilities. By August of 1987, Kristen and her coworker went over to their home 
and their job was to get the two children ready for bed. A lot of the times with home health jobs like this, parents and foster parents who have children with severe disabilities, they will get like respite care, so they don't have to constantly be taking care of that child. Every parent needs a break, let alone having a child with a severe disability. So when the two aides came over, the parents left for a little bit while Kristen and her coworker, two aides studying to become nurses, so they were trustworthy, they took care of the children. Kristen was to bathe her patient while the other coworker took care of the other boy. So each boy got their own one-on-one -on -one care from them. After about an hour, the parents got home and Kristen and her coworker left. However, when the parents found their foster son in bed, it turned out that his legs were bright red and blistered. He had suffered from severe burns to 60% of his body, clearly from the bath that he had been given by Kristen. The family said that the way their tub faucet worked was that it was preset to a specific temperature. It was actually locked to that temperature, so they never accidentally made the water too hot, because again, the boy was not able to tell his parents if it was too hot, so they wanted to make sure that even if they, you know, weren't paying too close of attention, they always had the water at the perfect temperature. The only way to make that water hotter was to unlock the faucet and adjust the knob to a higher temperature. So, the foster mother knew that Kristen went out of her way to raise the temperature to scalding hot levels and burned that poor child. The mother called the company who Kristen worked for, reported the incident, and said that she never wanted Kristen near her son ever again. So again, what this is basically saying is that this was not negligence. It seemed that Kristen purposely went out of her way to harm this young boy. By the winter of 1987, Kristen and Glenn decided that they wanted to get married, but neither of them wanted a big wedding. Even though Kristen's parents agreed to pay for a celebration, neither of them was really interested. So, by January of 1988, Glenn and Kristen eloped and Kristen Strickland became Kristen Gilbert. And as it happens in so many marriages, soon after marrying Kristen, her true colors started to emerge. There was one night in early February of that same year, 1988, only a month after getting married, that Kristen and Glenn got into an argument that ended with Kristen chasing Glenn with an 8-inch butcher knife from the kitchen. Glenn was able to lock himself in a room and get away from her until she calmed down, and obviously he ended up not being harmed. At that time, it seemed like maybe this was an isolated incident, maybe she was really stressed out from school, from the pressures that she had gotten from her parents to have a big wedding and going against their wishes. He wasn't entirely sure what was going on, but he was still hopeful that things would improve. He didn't immediately divorce her after this, and for a while, things did get a lot better. By early 1989, Kristen finally graduated from Greenville Community College, and by March of 1989, she started her career working as a nurse at the Leeds Veteran Affairs Medical Center in Massachusetts. She worked on Ward C, the ward where longer-term patients with more chronic conditions would go. She worked there for several years, and while there, other nurses looked up to her as an example of skill and competence. She was very well liked by her coworkers because of her bubbly personality, and she was very outgoing, and they also knew that she was an intelligent, dedicated nurse. She had a very good reputation for her care, especially for being calm and level-headed during times of crisis. She was often the first to notice if a patient had a life-threatening event such as a cardiac arrest. She was always calm, administering the required life-saving measures in the way that she was supposed to without stressing everybody else out. But what Kristen was most known for was her extensive knowledge of medications. As someone who has had to study countless types of medications, what their side effects are, what their dosages are supposed to be, what they're used for, etc., etc., this is something that's very impressive to me. She knew anything and everything you needed to know about all types of medications, and because of that, she was assigned to the med cart and was the one who administered medications to patients on most nights. So even if she wasn't like the main nurse that took care of a specific patient, if they needed an IV or certain medications, she would be called into the room to administer said medication. 
She was so well respected and so knowledgeable that other nurses would go to her first if they had any questions about any given medication. When she would give an answer, she would give a detailed description of each drug, what it did, and what its side effects were. She was known as virtually a walking medical textbook. However, as some time passed, other nurses noticed that Kristen was calling a lot of codes and Kristen always seemed to be involved when a crisis was happening. For those of you who don't know, a code is basically called when there's a life-threatening event like a heart attack or a stroke or something like that, something that needs immediate medical attention. She was almost always there when patients would go into cardiac arrest and was always the first one to call a code blue and was always the one to start the life-saving measures on a patient that had an emergent life-threatening event. So, some of the nurses reported their suspicions to the VA. One of the staff physicians actually looked at the charts of several of his patients who had died during the night shift hours, which is the shift that Kristen worked, and he noticed that Kristen's name was listed as the primary nurse for many of those patients. Some of the patients seemed to be progressing very well and weren't particularly sick when they died either. So this physician told Kristen's manager that he didn't want Kristen seeing any more of his patients. After that though, no disciplinary action was taken. The hospital apparently reviewed the concerns that the nurses and physician brought forward, but they found that the death rate at their hospital was in accordance with the average death rates at other hospitals. So, they didn't think that there was any reason to raise concern. They didn't want to blame Kristen for all of these codes and didn't want to make these very severe accusations if she truly was just trying her best and was doing whatever she could to save these patients and just was not able to. She could have just had really bad luck. So, Kristen carried on as normal, but her being involved in so many deaths did earn her the nickname Angel of Death at the hospital. This was something that was joked about by the other nurses, though no one ever took it seriously. They again thought that she was just very unlucky and had like this looming cloud following her around. By December of 1990, Kristen took a maternity leave after becoming pregnant and subsequently giving birth to her first child, a son named Brian. Upon returning to work in February of 1991, she grew very close with her co-workers once again, especially the ones who were raising children. She started having cookouts and throwing baby showers for other co-workers. They spent their evenings getting dinner or going out to clubs, and by all accounts, everybody also loved Kristen's husband, Glenn. She was living the life of a suburban soccer mom who loved her job and loved her baby. Things seemed to be going great for her. Around that same time, there was one incident where Kristen got off the phone and rushed to a coworker, warning that she had just received a bomb threat on the phone. Apparently, somebody told her that they planted a bomb on Ward C. Apparently, at the same time, Kristen went into a closet where she found a mysterious box that looked to have a swastika on the side. She showed her co-workers and she said that she feared that this might be the bomb. So, police were obviously called, the hospital was evacuated, and police spent hours searching every square inch of the hospital for a bomb. But after all of that excitement, they found nothing. The mysterious box also just turned out to be a Kleenex box with a swastika drawn in pen on the side. Obviously, the thought here is that Kristen called in the bomb threat and made that box to get attention. The nurses around her started to suspect that maybe she did call in this bomb threat, but they couldn't be sure. It wasn't totally like her to do something so dramatic. She had never done anything else like that. There were a couple of times where, you know, she would tell her coworkers that a patient would attack her. There was one time that she actually dislocated her shoulder because of a patient, though some of the nurses were a little bit suspicious of that too because she was able to like pop her own shoulder out and then pop it back in. So there was the possibility that she did that for attention as well. 
but still the nurses around her, they all really loved her. Everybody who knew her loved her. So nobody thought that she would do something so extreme just to get attention. By November 13th, 1993, Kristen's 26th birthday, she actually gave birth to her second son who obviously shared her birthday, Raymond. Up until that point, her marriage with Glenn had always been okay. There hadn't been any more violent outbursts, and even though they would argue, it was never about anything that the average married couple wouldn't argue about. The two had figured out their work shifts in a way that made it so that someone was always home to take care of the children so that they didn't have to do daycare. But after the birth of Raymond, things started to go downhill with Glenn. Kristen and him would fight pretty much daily. They would go long periods without speaking to one another, and their work shifts just weren't working anymore. They never saw each other, and even though someone was always home to take care of the children, that wasn't the best thing for their relationship. At the same time, Kristen started exercising more. She lost a bunch of weight and started dressing a little bit more provocatively. She completely changed her look at home and at work and around the community, clearly saying to those around her that she wanted attention. That same year in 1993, shortly after returning to work from her second maternity leave, Kristen met a 30-year-old man named James Peralt. He was a single dad who was absolutely dedicated to his children. He worked as a security officer at the VA hospital and he was a veteran himself. His shift was from 3 p.m. to 11 p.m., which was around the same time that Kristen would work. The two started talking at work and eventually they started getting drinks together after work. It started out well because anytime there would be a medical emergency in Ward C, James would get called up to the room because it was a rule at the hospital that an officer had to be present at each medical emergency, and that gave her the opportunity to show off her nursing skills to James. Kristen loved the attention that she got from James, and by that fall of 1994, the two started dating. Of course, for James, it was a nice new relationship with a nurse where he worked, but for Kristen, obviously, she had to keep the entire thing a secret. But... Neither of them did a very good job of keeping their relationship a secret. Their relationship started again because they would chat and hang out whenever they could during their shifts. One night, James walked Kristen to her car and they shared a kiss. Eventually, the two would kiss at work whenever they got the chance. It was clear to Kristen's co-workers who all knew Glenn that she was having an affair and was cheating on her husband. Then at the same time at home, she would often bring up James's name. It started just as casual stories about a co-worker, but Glenn started to get annoyed at just how often she was bringing up this other man. Obviously, Glenn grew suspicious, but at the time, he never got the confirmation that she was cheating on him. But at the same time, he did notice other changes. Kristen had never been one to cook very much, but all of a sudden, she started cooking meals for Glenn. He said that when he ate her food, it tasted a bit chalk-like, but he never wanted to complain because he didn't want to cause yet another argument by bringing up her bad cooking. Maybe she was just getting into a new hobby and wanted to cook more, and he didn't want to discourage her by saying, you know, your food doesn't taste very good, it kind of tastes weird and chalky. But then, Glenn noticed that he started to feel sick. One time in November of 1994, he spent all day feeling very ill, feeling that he had the flu or something like that. He had been suffering from fatigue and severe muscle cramps before he started vomiting and feeling like he was going to pass out. He stayed home from work that day, hoping to sleep his symptoms off, but they only got worse and he ended up in the ER. While in the ER, he called Kristen to let her know what happened and she showed up shortly after to support him. After taking some tests, the doctors found out that Glenn had critically low levels of potassium and found out that he was actually having cardiac arrhythmias. This was very unusual because the doctors knew that for him to have such a low level, he would have had to gone several days without drinking any water or any fluids whatsoever. 
So because of this, he was given a supplement to get his levels back up to normal. He took that supplement over the course of the next few days and he seemed to start feeling better. At work, Kristen told her coworkers about what happened, saying that Glenn had suffered from dangerously low potassium, but he was having trouble getting it back up. Kristen told another coworker that Glenn needed another prescription for his potassium levels since they still weren't back up to normal from what the doctor gave him. Which again, this actually was not true. Glenn had gone to the doctor a few days after his emergency room visit for a follow-up and they told him that his levels were back to normal and he was feeling a lot better. But Kristen told a coworker that she needed to grab some potassium for Glenn anyways. However, the other nurse that saw her take this medication for Glenn was not comfortable with what she saw. So she told another nurse about it. Then they looked in the pocket of Kristen's nurse jacket and they found medication sticking out but it wasn't potassium. There were two drugs called nifidipine and captopril. Nifidipine is a calcium channel blocker, which are used to treat certain heart conditions and are given to stroke patients a lot of times. This medication causes the vessels in the heart to relax and dilate, therefore lowering blood pressure. Captopril is used to treat hypertension and congestive heart failure, also to lower blood pressure but if it is used improperly or given at too high of a dose, these drugs can cause a lot of problems. Obviously, if your blood pressure is too low and your vessels are too relaxed, then you can get very lightheaded and it can cause you to pass out. Then, about a week or two after Glenn's ER visit, Kristen arrived home with a big syringe filled with clear liquid. She pulled it out and told Glenn that she actually did not trust the ER doctors. She said that she didn't like how they treated him and didn't agree with the diagnosis. So she said that she wanted to get a sample of his blood to test on her own at work. Of note, this was against the hospital's policy to test samples that employees gave to them outside of the hospital. So there was no reason that she should have been taking that sample. She was not going to test it at work. Either way, she told Glenn that the syringe she had had a saline flush, which she needed to do before getting his blood sample. So she put a tourniquet on his arm and prepped him for the injection. He allowed her to inject the clear fluid in, but as she was doing so, his arm started to feel numb and cold and then his skin started to become pale and translucent. Then the thought occurred to Glenn that never once has a nurse flushed his blood with saline before taking a blood draw. That would dilute the sample and there was no reason for that. So Glenn tried pulling away, but Kristen pinned him down and injected him quicker while ripping the tourniquet off to make sure that the fluid entered his bloodstream quicker. Then Glenn got lightheaded and fell to the ground before losing consciousness. As he lied on the floor, he watched as Kristen hurriedly grabbed the syringes from the home, put them in her bag, and then leave the house to go to work. Thankfully, Glenn did eventually regain consciousness he woke up the next morning and asked Kristen what happened, and Kristen told Glenn that he fainted. She said that it happens all the time, it's no big deal. But she asked him not to tell anybody about it, so I guess he didn't. I don't know what he believed at this point, but he didn't seem to think that Kristen did anything wrong. Even though the two had been fighting a lot and they were talking about divorce and he had his suspicions about, you know, this other man that she was talking about from work, he didn't think that Kristen would actually do anything to hurt him. In fact, she seemed to care a lot about his health to the point that she wanted to get a second opinion on his health issue. He didn't know about the medication that she took, those two, you know, heart drugs, and for the time being, he didn't know about anything that was going on at the hospital either. But of course, given the context and knowing what kind of person Kristen is, the thought here is that Kristen tried to kill Glenn, but was not successful. After that happened, as you will see, it appeared that Glenn stayed in sort of a denial for quite a long time, never wanting to believe that Kristen was capable of wanting to hurt him, no matter what she did. Around that same time, things were not going well with James. He was tired of being kept a secret. He was tired of seeing a married woman. So he told Kristen that if she didn't end things with Glenn, that he was going to leave. 
So, as he was telling her that, Kristen picked up the phone and let Glenn know that she wanted a divorce and then just hung up. Then, she looked at James and smiled. She finally took the initiative that he was asking of her. Little did he know she was already taking initiative to get Glenn out of the picture, but obviously didn't work, and so there was no reason for him to know about that. When hearing that news, Glenn didn't know what to say. She literally called him, said she wanted a divorce, and then just hung up before he even got a chance to say anything. A few days later, Glenn told Kristen that he wanted to go to counseling. He said that he still loved her and wanted to stay with her for the sake of the children. He said that seven years of marriage was worth trying out counseling. So, they did go to one appointment, but it didn't go well. As soon as they got home from the appointment, Kristen demanded that Glenn move out. A week later, though, Kristen was the one who moved out of the home. She ended up moving into an apartment nearby. She ended up living only two miles away from James and a few minutes away from Glenn's work. The kids stayed with Glenn, and Kristen would see the kids during the day while he was at work. Things seemed to be going pretty well for everybody involved, especially Kristen, since she was able to go about her relationship with James freely without any issues of her husband being there. Meanwhile, things at work seemed to be going just fine for Kristen. One patient that most everybody at the hospital was familiar with was 66-year-old Stanley Jagodowski. Stanley was a veteran of the Korean War, discharged from the army in 1954. He then went on to work as a truck driver for many decades after. At that time, he was admitted to the hospital three times within eight months. He was severely overweight, a smoker and a drinker with some very questionable eating habits, and he rarely ever exercised. When he was admitted, his doctors found that he had type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, irregular heart rhythm, and enlarged ventricles. His wife of almost 40 years, Claire, told the hospital that she could no longer take care of him, saying that she actually suffered a heart attack herself recently. Stanley was a very, very stubborn man, never following the doctor's orders to eat healthier or be more active. He never believed that changing his habits would actually make a difference. Working in the hospital, working with patients like this, I totally get it. I totally understand that there are so many patients that are like, I'm not changing anything. You don't know me. You don't know my life. Nothing that you're going to say is going to make a difference in my life. I will continue doing exactly what I'm doing. It's very frustrating. But either way, due to his type 2 diabetes, he had developed sores on his right leg that were not healing. For those of you who don't know, degenerative neuropathy is very common in patients with type 2 diabetes. Basically, the nerves in your legs degenerate and you start to lose feeling in your legs, especially your feet. Many patients will come in with sores or even open wounds on their feet or lower legs that they didn't even know was there. There was one patient that I saw where his sores on his feet were so deep that you could see his tendon and his bone, and he literally did not know that they were there because he never checked his skin integrity. It's not like funny or anything, but it's just so crazy to think that people just don't look at their feet, especially knowing that they can't feel them. That was not a pretty sight to see. But either way, Stanley was in the hospital because he had an infection to his right leg that had spread and it was not healing. The doctors first had to amputate his foot, but the infection spread more and they ended up having to amputate just above the knee. Again, this is a very common thing that I've also seen at the hospital. A lot of patients with diabetic neuropathy eventually will have to get a leg or a limb amputated because you know, these things can get infected if there's all these wounds on your legs and you don't know about them and you're not taking care of them. It's very easy for them to get infected. And again, you won't feel the pain that is coming from the infection. You might just notice redness. And sometimes by the time you get to the hospital, it's a little bit too late. So they just got to chop it off. That amputation was done at a hospital in Rhode Island. After that, by August 12th, 1995, Stanley was then transferred to Leeds in Ward C to recover. While there, he, by all accounts, was not the most pleasant patient to be around. 
He used the hell out of his call light. He complained constantly and he liked to stir up trouble. I know I bring up my own experiences a lot, but there were so many patients just like him. He reminds me of a lot of the people that I've worked with at the hospital. But either way, as his stay in the hospital progressed, he did get better. Family members said that after the amputation, even though he was obviously still in pain, he had to use a wheelchair to get around and losing his leg was not ideal. Even though all of those things considered, he looked healthier than ever before. Because of this, the hospital was preparing him to transfer from Ward C to the long-term care unit of the hospital, which is where patients will go when they still need to recover, but they don't need as constant attention. The only thing they needed to wait for was for a bed to open up in that other ward. On the evening of August 21st, 1995, two nurses in Ward C, Jeff Begley and Beverly Scott, worked together to give Stanley what he needed to get ready for bed. Again, he was the type of patient who would complain, he would cry out in pain all of the time from the smallest things, so it was just easier if two nurses took care of him to, you know, roll him over, get his stuff taken care of. They got his gown changed, they checked his IV, they checked his skin integrity and the status of his healing amputation, and made sure that everything was stable, which it was. So, they got him to bed, and left his room by 8.20 that evening. A short time later, they saw Kristen entering Stanley's room, holding a syringe of medication. To note, the room that Stanley was in was close to the nursing station, where a lot of nurses would sit and do notes and things like that, so they were able to see his room whenever they were there. Jeff and Beverly, though, were a bit confused because they didn't think that Stanley needed any additional medication, but sometimes a doctor will order a patient to get meds without notifying the entire nursing staff. So they figured that he probably just got ordered some new meds and they just weren't informed of it immediately. As Kristen was in his room, however, the other nurses heard him screaming out in pain before watching Kristen calmly walk out of his room down the hall and away from the nursing station. She then went into the ICU ward of the hospital to relieve another nurse of duty for, I believe, a break, and then she spent some of her shift there. Now, Stanley was again known as, now again, Stanley was known as being a bit dramatic. He was a chronic complainer. He was someone who, even if the nurses were just rolling him over in bed to get him dressed, he would complain and yell out. But this yell sounded different than the rest, so that is why Jeff and Beverly were concerned. They felt like he was actually in pain. So, they went into his room and they asked Stanley what was wrong, and he said that his arm was hurting after he got his medication. So, Beverly and Jeff stayed with him for a few minutes to make sure that he was okay and that he wasn't actually hurt, and after a few minutes, everything seemed fine. Stanley ended up telling them that he felt a lot better. However, by 8.43 p.m., less than 20 minutes after Kristen paid him a visit, Stanley went into sudden cardiac arrest. As that was happening, other nurses were seeing other patients, so there was a slight delay in the response team getting to Stanley. In total, it took them two minutes to get to him, but thankfully, after extensive efforts from the emergency response team, he did survive this code. After getting his heart back and beating by 9 p.m., he was transferred to the ICU, where Kristen was now working and was overseeing his care. In the ICU, he was intubated and hooked up to a ventilator. Now, Stanley's daughter, Susan, had been coming to the hospital five times per week to visit her hospital. His trip to the ICU was one of the days that she was not there, so when he was transferred, she was called and asked to come in. She went into his father's room and sat with him for a while as he lied there with the ventilator keeping him alive. This entire thing was very overwhelming for Susan, understandably, because he had been improving so well within the past few days, and now all of a sudden, he was coding. So, after sitting with him for a few hours, him being totally fine, Susan left the room to tell a nurse that she was feeling very lightheaded and drained. She seemed to have been so overwhelmed that her body just reacted by passing out. 
so she was admitted to the hospital herself. A few hours had passed and Stanley was totally fine while his daughter was in his room. But after she had left and after being admitted, after she woke up shortly after midnight, she learned that Stanley had coded again and once more after that. By 11.38 p.m. that evening on August 21st, Stanley had passed away. So, Obviously, the thought here is that while someone was in Stanley's room with him, nothing happened, but as soon as he was alone, something happened. Another frequent flyer at the Leeds Veterans Affair Medical Center was 35-year-old Henry Huden. Henry Huden was a graduate of East Longmeadow High School in Massachusetts, class of 1977. After graduating, he went on to enlist in the military, just like his father had. He was known to be outgoing, easygoing, and to have a very strong moral compass. He ended up at the Royal Air Force Station in Lakenheath, England. Well, there was one night while being stationed there where Henry and a few friends decided to go to the bar. There, they met with their base commander, his wife, and their children. His commander told him about a fight that had been happening in the back of the bar and asked Henry if he could break it up. Once again, he was known as having a very easygoing attitude and was known as sort of a peacemaker around the Air Force. So, he went to the back of the bar to try and talk some sense into the men fighting, but as he was doing so, there was a third man who came up behind him and struck him in the head with a beer bottle, which caused his body to go into shock and fall to the ground. He fell so hard that his head slammed against the concrete floor, which caused his retina and his right eye to detach and several teeth shattered. From there, he spent the following three weeks in a coma. He went through several surgeries and intensive treatments, eventually waking up and surviving his attack. But he had suffered severe brain damage. According to those around him, after waking up from that coma, he was never the same. This once easygoing, chill guy was now irritable, becoming enraged at the drop of a dime. He became extremely emotional and started to suffer from paranoid delusions. He reportedly started hearing voices and was constantly paranoid that people were stalking him. Because of this, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. After this, he was honorably discharged from the army and he was sent back to the US. After that, Henry spent the rest of his life in and out of hospital, taking a multitude of medications and suffering constantly from mental health issues. Between the years of 1986 and 1995, his fluctuating mental states caused him to be admitted into the Leeds VA over a dozen times. Each time, he would be prescribed a medication, which would work very well for a while. But after a few months, he would have another episode, which landed him back in the hospital to get his medication medications adjusted. Each time, he would spend anywhere from a week or two up to a year in the hospital before being released again. By the fall of 1995, his condition started to get worse. None of Henry's meds were working anymore. He started to lash out, and the worse he felt, the more he hated taking his medication. There were times that he would be admitted, but he would leave the hospital against doctor's orders. Basically, he would escape when he wasn't supposed to leave. By December 7th of 1995, after leaving the VA hospital on his own accord, so without being discharged and against doctor's orders, Henry spent the entire night vomiting and shaking. He called his mother to tell her what was going on, and she told him to get himself back to the hospital, but he didn't want to. Eventually, his mother arrived to his place to talk to him and try to help. He didn't have any appetite, and he couldn't hold anything down. So, his mother drove him to the hospital, asking for him to be readmitted. He actually told the hospital that he took too many pain medications because his arm was really hurting, and at that time, he went into a bathroom and continued sounding like he was throwing up and heaving. So, obviously, at that time, the staff thought that he may have overdosed on drugs, either because of the story of his arm hurting or because he wanted to take his own life because he was known to have this laundry list of mental health issues. But once he was admitted, the staff checked the toilet to see if he had been throwing up a lot from overdosing on drugs, but it didn't look like he had consumed alcohol or a bunch of drugs or anything. 
He just looked like he had white sputum coming up. Then they took his vitals and everything was pretty much normal. He had a normal temperature, a normal heart rate, a normal blood pressure, and normal respirations. His reason for admission was listed as pain from a drug overdose, but after taking his blood work, it came back as negative for drugs or alcohol. So the hospital staff were confused as to why he lied about taking the drugs, but he was clearly sick. The thought here is that, again, Henry was known for being in and out of the hospital for mental health issues, so his mother was worried that if he just came back in with the flu, that they wouldn't admit him and just send him back home, but she wanted him to get the help that he needed, so it's thought that he purposely lied about taking too many drugs so that he could get readmitted. But again, they thought that he probably was just suffering from the flu. The hospital, though, they knew that he had schizophrenia and was not mentally well, so all of those things together could explain why his condition seemed so bad. Either way, his nurses checked his vitals multiple more times throughout that day, and they remained very stable. By the evening of December 8th, 1995, Henry's doctor, Dr. Blackman, assessed him. He found that he was stable, alert, and aware. Again, besides the fact that he had a flu and schizophrenia, he was normal and totally stable. He wasn't drowsy, he wasn't sleepy, or disoriented in any way. At the same time, Kristen started her work shift. She, of course, was taking care of Henry that evening. That same evening, she had also been emailing back and forth with James on her work computer, where he said that he wanted her to attend a Christmas party with him and his military friends. At the same time that evening, five hours after arriving though, Henry's condition suddenly changed. He went from being completely stable with normal vitals to his heart rate randomly doubling and his blood pressure spiked through the roof. Henry went into sudden cardiac arrest. When he did, Kristen was the one who called the code and began resuscitation efforts as the emergency staff rushed over to him. Part of the emergency staff was James Peralt, again because he was the cop on duty at the time. By the time Dr. Blackman arrived to the room, Kristen told him that Henry had a seizure and was asystole, which means that he had no cardiac output. Basically, his heart was not working and he flatlined. Because of this, he was intubated and given epinephrine to restart his heart. And after 25 minutes of life-saving measures, he was back. This was a big win for the medical staff who put in so much effort into bringing him back. Henry opened his eyes and it appeared that none of what happened to him had affected his brain function, even flatlining. He was okay. Dr. Blackman was raving with excitement. He was so proud of his medical team for bringing Henry back. Three hours passed while Henry remained awake and was just trying to recover. During that time, Kristen emailed James back about the Christmas party. But that entire time, she didn't attend to Henry once. It was standard procedure that nurses would take vitals from each patient once per hour, but she didn't take Henry's one time in those three hours. Again, instead, she was emailing back and forth with James. It happened around that time that James took a few minutes to respond back to Kristen. And it just so happened that within the few minutes that James was not emailing her back, Kristen called another code on Henry. But once again, the medical staff rushed back in, and this time, Dr. Blackman used Bertillium to restart his heart. This was a very last resort medication that was only used if all other attempts had failed, which at that point, they had. And thanks to Dr. Blackman, once again, Henry was brought back. He was awake once again, and Dr. Blackman told his staff that if anything changed about his condition, he wanted to be notified immediately. After coding for a second time at 7.20 p.m., Kristen sent James another email, which again, he took a few minutes to respond to. So, by 7.30 p.m., Kristen called a third code on Henry. Once again, Dr. Blackburn brought him back to life. Henry was such a fighter, using every ounce of strength in his body to stay alive each time. But this third time, Henry remained unconscious. Now, between each code, Kristen again was emailing with James, who responded pretty quickly most times, 
but it happened that when James wasn't responding quickly, a code had been called. What a coincidence. Then, as we know, she got to see James every time a code was called. So if he wasn't responding for a while, she got to see him during a code. Crazy. That's so cool. But after the third code at 7.58 p.m., she emailed James back again, and the two continued to talk back and forth for the next hour, making plans for later that night. But by 9 p.m., he stopped responding. So she messaged him a few more times, asking where to meet, but he didn't respond. Then, as it so happened, by 9.35 p.m., Kristen called another code on Henry. The team responded again and tried for 25 minutes to save him, but after this fourth attempt, Dr. Blackman made the tough decision to stop resuscitation efforts. He hadn't responded for a while. He was totally unconscious, and he flatlined again. By 10.05 p.m., 35-year-old Henry Huden passed away. The next death that happened at the VAMC under Kristen's watch was Kenny Cutting. Kenny was a U.S. Army veteran, eventually being stationed at Fort Devens in Massachusetts. After that, him and his wife gave birth to their son, Jeffrey. However, after only 15 months after starting his time in the Army, he was given a diagnosis that would change his life. Kenny was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, or MS, which is a chronic neurodegenerative disease that affects your ability to move. MS can present in a few different ways, but overall, it is caused by inflammatory demyelination of your nerves, axonal injury, and development of central nervous system lesions. Basically, the protective coating on your nerves is deteriorated, which leads to muscular atrophy as well as spinal cord and brain lesions. The symptoms vary from person to person, but oftentimes involves blurred vision, pain in the eye described as ice pick-like sensation in your eye, which is just horrible to think about. Speech problems occur, issues with gait and overall movement, extreme fatigue, mood problems, and cognitive problems. It is a progressive disease with no known cure at this point. There are a lot of medications to manage the symptoms, but if your MS is severe enough, like in Kenny's case, you don't have that much time, to be quite frank. In Kenny's case, his symptoms did develop quite rapidly. His wife tried to take care of him at home, but things progressed far too quickly. He could hardly see at all. He had a lot of bowel and bladder issues and got very frequent infections and colds. By 1980, he was now using a wheelchair and had a very hard time taking care of himself. So, he ended up going to a long-term care program at a VA hospital. He started at Jamaica Plain VA Hospital, but he didn't like it there. So, he transferred to Leeds, which had a very good reputation. Once there, Kenny was very happy with the care that he received. By 1995, 41-year-old Kenny was basically without use of his arms or legs, and he required pretty much round-the-clock care. He underwent multiple surgeries for bowel-related issues, but never once had he experienced any heart problems. This was actually a very important thing for the doctors to make sure of because cardiovascular issues can cause fatal results during the intense surgeries that he was getting. So, they were all very confident that he never had heart problems because, again, if you go under general anesthesia and you do have heart problems your risk for some sort of heart attack or event increases a lot. So, by November 1st, 1995, Kenny had a complete colonoscopy. He was put on antibiotics for an infection he had, but after that, he recovered nicely and he was set to stay in Ward C at Leeds Hospital. By November 20th, he was alert. He was in fair physical condition and had no other issues beyond, obviously, his MS. By January, though, his bowel issues were back and by January 26th, 1996, he needed another surgery. So, he got that surgery and was then transferred to the ICU afterwards. By February 1st, he was reported by others to have been recovering very well. Things were back on track, he was talking and alert, and had no remaining issues at that point. He was recovering. However, by February 2nd, 1996, Kristen and James had been chatting about plans to see each other that evening. Kristen told James that she could be at his house at around 10, but that was odd because she didn't get off until midnight that night. 
Throughout the day on February 2nd, Kenny continued to improve, getting better and better after his surgeries. By 6 p.m. that night, Kristen, who had been with Kenny all day, went on her dinner break. It was around that time that she asked her supervisor if she could go home early if things slowed down enough that evening, and they said yes as long as there wasn't anybody in the ICU. But again, we know that Kenny was in the ICU. The nurse that took over during Kristen's dinner break said that his heart rate was very normal within the low 100s. After the dinner break, Kristen came back and the other nurse was relieved of his duty, so Kristen was now back taking care of Kenny. However, within just a few minutes of Kristen returning to Kenny's room, his heart rate suddenly jumped back up to being between 120 and 130 beats per minute. Then, he went into VFib before eventually flatlining. At that time, Kenny actually had a DNR, or do not resuscitate, in place. Because of how badly his condition fluctuated, him and his family made the decision not to resuscitate him if things got to that point. And of course, when there is a DNR on file, the nurses and people taking care of him would know that. So, without anyone being able to legally do anything to save him, they weren't able to administer their life-saving measures. So, by 7.15 p.m. that night, he died. By 8.15 p.m., after finishing up the duties that the hospital must do after a patient died, Kristen asked a supervisor if she could go home early on sick leave since the hospital was slow and her patient had just died, so there was nobody in the ICU at that time. She was granted this request and was able to meet up with James by 10 p.m. that night for their planned date. It's almost as if she knew that she would be able to make it home early that night before she even saw Kenny. It's almost like she knew that if Kenny died, there would be no efforts to resuscitate him and that she was going to be able to clear the ICU and go home early to see James. What a coincidence. So that is where I'm going to end part one. To summarize, we know that Kristen grew up to be an intelligent student who excelled academically. Then she went on to become a very respected nurse, wife, and mother. But then things changed. She no longer wanted to be with Glenn, and instead, she wanted to be with James, who worked as an officer at the hospital. At the same time, it seems that she suddenly started calling code after code after code, and each time, she got to see James. But as of right now, we don't know how she could have caused these patients to code so often. We don't know what was causing these issues, or even if maybe she just had really, really, really bad luck or I guess on the night that she got to go home early, really good luck. So, in part two, we will discuss the remainder of the patients who are victimized by Kristen. Then we will talk about the investigation and subsequent trial that take place as a result. But for now, I want to know your thoughts so far. What do you think about all of these patients who are dying on Kristen's watch? What do you think of her relationship with James? Do you think that she really is just trying to get attention and is willing to kill patients to do so? Do you think that other nurses are going to catch on to what she is doing if she is purposely doing this? And what do you think about James? Do you think he'll catch on that she's always there when he's coming to these codes? Let me know this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos and so you don't miss out on part two. You will not want to miss part two, the conclusion to this case. There's so much more to go over. There's so much that just ties things together so you will not want to miss part two. Make sure you have the notification bell on so you do not miss that. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All are going to be linked down below and if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to send those suggestions to my Google Doc, which is also going to be listed down below. Also, let me know what you guys think of these series. Do you like the Serial Killer series? Do you prefer it when I do more of the mysterious, like missing 411 cases? What do you think overall of what we're doing here this October? Let me know your thoughts down below. Either way, with that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!